Welcome to Pharmaceutical Calculations. And my name is Nakenya Price. And we're going to be looking at the specialized dosage form suspension. We often would be required to extemporaneously compound suspensions in our um, practice, whether it be community or hospital setting. And therefore, we need to know how to perform calculations to determine the, the amounts of ingredients that are needed for this specialized dosage form. So we're going to get into it. So the objectives are laid out here nicely. We have to explain some terms. We are going to have to identify the different sources of active ingredients that will be used to compound our suspensions. We have to interpret the symbols and abbreviations. So when we get the prescription order or the um, medication order, we know what it is that we need to calculate, and especially in terms of dose. We are going to have to learn how to calculate, or this is really a refresher on how to accurately calculate the dose based on age, weight, body surface error, and using a master formula. As I said before, we have to know, know how to calculate depending on the source of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And we are gonna be also calculating some of the excipients that will be used. Now we have not covered the whole gambit of excipients that are normally used in suspension, especially in the manufactured ones, but surely we're going to look at the staples of excipients used in suspension and how we go about calculating them depending on the concentrations that are used. And of course, we're going to have to do a calculation from start to finish using all of our concepts that we have learned so far in pharmaceutical calculations with 100% accuracy on how to um, calculate ingredients for suspension. All right, so your lecture notes will be sent to the relevant platforms. That's where you're going to access this video as well as the written lecture. And then you will be tested after the session, uh, a two hour quiz that will be graded and it will be opened from a certain time, which will be announced to you. It's more than a day. So you'll have more time, more, more than enough time to go through your videos over and over and over again until you think you have a, achieved or mastered the concepts and then you get into the quiz. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at ingredients used in a suspension. First, we have to determine what a suspension is. A suspension is, is, a, is an heterogeneous um, dosage form and heterogeneous meaning that it's different from a solution in that you have finely divided powders that are suspended in a vehicle. That means the powders are not soluble. Usually insoluble ingredients are used to form suspensions. And more often than not, the insoluble ingredient, it tends to be the active pharmaceutical ingredient. That is the ingredient that is going to um, confer a pharmaceutical response or a pharmacological response, excuse me. And therefore, we, it has to be formulated in a specific way. I'm not going to go into the pharmaceutics of it, but just to give you an overview so it, you have an understanding as to why you're calculating for these ingredients. So we have, of course, the pharmaceutical, active pharmaceutical ingredients, such as your paracetamol, which is insoluble in water. I should say also that your suspensions most often are aqueous suspensions. You have non-aqueous suspensions as well, but generally speaking, majority of the suspensions that you will encounter will be aqueous in nature, meaning it is water-based. And your active ingredients and sometimes other excipients will not be soluble in water and therefore a suspension will be formulated. We have our vehicle and the vehicle is really, as it suggests, as we travel in a vehicle, the vehicle is going to carry or suspend, allow the particles to be suspended in this formulation. 
It's usually what, as I said before, but you can also have vehicle that could be um, syrup. Uh, you have vehicle that could be al um, alcohol if you are talking about a non aqueous um, formulation or oil. But generally speaking, water is definitely generally the vehicle of choice, especially for oral suspensions. We also have sweeteners, of course, going to confer sweetness and palatability to the dosage form. Preservative, you know, the preservative is not going to keep the dosage home forever, but it will slow down the degradation rate of our dosage form by reducing the bacterial load within the formulation. And if you should know from your science background that where water is, bacteria also thrives. So therefore, we want to lower the bacterial load in our suspensions or in our formulations, generally speaking, because we don't want to harm our patients because of bacterial infection, that's one. And to a lesser extent, some of these bacteria will also break down things like our suspending agent, which we'll speak to in a short while from now. And if it breaks down the suspending agent, then your suspension will not be as stable as it should and cause challenges. Also, the bacteria may also um, destroy the active pharmaceutical ingredient and make it or increase the chances of it degrading faster. So the preservative is what's going to preserve your formulation, keeping it a long time, a longer time than when there is no preservative and then you know you have spoilage of the dosage form. Flavorant, of course, uh, to confer palatability to make it more acceptable to your patients. And of course, the suspending agent, which is what is going to cause your particles to suspend long enough for a patient to pour off a dose so that each time when they pour off the dose, they'll be getting the right amount of drug. So as I said before, a suspension is a, is no, is a heterogeneous dispersed system that contains one or more insoluble active ingredients um, in a vehicle, which is usually water or other vehicles, such as oils and alcohols, as I said. Um, we have a picture there of Pepto-Bismol. Everybody knows what Pepto-Bismol is and what it is used for, it's used as antidiarrheal, and that is an example of a suspension. The vehicle, as I said before, is an inert liquid that will allow the dispersed particles to be suspended um, in the suspension. In terms of a solution, the particles are not suspended, they are dissolved, the solutes are dissolved, and therefore, it facilitates measurements or handling of that dosage form or handling of a, of a dose by the patient because the particles are not suspended in a vehicle. A preservative, um, this is what is going to be used to lower the bacterial load within a formulation, as I said before, and examples that we have that we use in oral suspensions our oral dosage forms are benzoic acid, 0.1% weight and volume in your final formulation. And this is normally used for oral preparations. You have a myriad of other preservatives. The parabens, you would have heard about methyl and propyl parabens. They're also used in oral preparations as well. And they're also used in external preparations. So there are a myriad of the preservative, they have different classes, but we're going to only focus on benzoic acid. You need to know the concentration of benzoic acid that will be used, and I um, implore you to look at it, it's 0.1%. Suspending agent confers viscosity to the vehicle. If the vehicle is not viscous, such as a syrup, if syrup can also be a vehicle, um, it confers viscosity because you do not want your particles, your insoluble particles to sediment too quickly. It's just like mixing sand and water. The sand particles are so dense, they're going to fall to the bottom of the 
container very quickly and you will not be able to pour off an equal amount or a homogeneous mixture of sand and water because the particles are falling or sedimenting at a fast rate. Therefore, if we increase the viscosity of our body agent or our vehicle, then it slows down the sedimentation rate. And therefore, that is why we add suspending agents to our formulation. Suspending agents that we use are that you will encounter when you do compounding and dispensing would be tragacan compound, which is 2%, and tragacan compound contains the suspending agent tragacan and other ingredients such as acacia, starch, and um, sucrose. It's a combination. That's why it is called tragacan compound. And then we have tragacan, which is a plain suspending agent, which um, we use at a level of 0.2% while tragacan compound is used at 2%. Sweeteners, as I said before, confer some amount of palatability to your dosage form. It makes it sweet, makes the, 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 compound, the formulation sweet, especially if you have APIs that are quite bitter and patients are not going to be accepting of that, you add sweetness to it. Uh, the most popular sweetener that we use is syrup, which is made of sucrose at a concentration of 65% of sucrose or above. Um, as you know, syrup is really just sugar and water. Um, some syrups on the market have um, preservatives, but generally speaking, syrup, you know, what your grandmother and my grandmother would make back in the day, they didn't put preservatives in there because the sucrose, the high concentration of sucrose alone would not be habitable for most bacterial organisms to thrive. So therefore the syrup itself acts as a preservative, right? So that's why your jams won't have these bacterial, um, bacterial colonies growing in there because of the high um, sucrose content in the formulation. So your syrup is a, a common sweetener. Other sweeteners, alternative agents such as sorbitol, mannitol, saccharin and aspartame. Saccharin and aspartame are known as artificial sweeteners. You'll find those, the aspartame and the saccharin in sweet and low and all those things and stevia is another artificial sweetener. Xylitol is another one that is often used by manufacturers. Um, these can be used when persons cannot use sucrose in it, either because they have an underlying condition such as diabetes or the doctor does not want, you know, to expose especially children to dental caries. Artificial sweeteners are normally chosen for that particular reason. So you will see on the market sugar-free um, um, formulations. That means that they are sweetened with artificial sweeteners. But generally speaking, we will be encountering artificial sweeteners like aspartame and saccharin when you do your compounding and dispensing. But generally speaking, you are mostly going to be using syrup, which can be used at a concentration range of 10 to 30% of the final preparation. Flavorants. Now, this is used based on the compounder's um, experience. We normally use them in terms of drops, very small quantities, really, less than one mil, often because they are very concentrated, very, very um, flavorful. That's why they are flavorant. And these mask unpleasant taste and smell of the preparation. And they, you know, it makes it palatable for the patient. And examples could be strawberry flavor, lemon flavor, vanilla flavor, um, etc. So the sources of your active ingredient, and when you're making a suspension like your Pepto-Bismol or your calamine suspension or chalk suspension or magnesium trisilicate, which is an antacid, you have to get your active ingredient from somewhere. And the active ingredient comes from two sources, maybe the pure powder, the pure insoluble powder, or it may be from manufactured products that have that will be used or altered to prepare your suspension, such as your solid unit dosage forms, 
such as tablets and capsules. Beyond use dating is very important in extemporaneously compounded products, whether it be a suspension, an ointment, a cream, a solution, capsules, tablets, there needs to be an assigned beyond use date. And really, this is the date um, that the patient will be advised that the product should not be used beyond. It guarantees the patient's safety and it is normally recommended by the United States Pharmacopeia. Um, so um, the beyond use date for orally compounded, extemporaneously compounded suspensions or extemporaneously compounded products um, such as solutions and suspensions, once they're used for oral use and once they have water in there, they are to be used for a maximum of 14 days. So you can't make anything for 15 days. You can't guarantee that after that 14th day that the product will not go bad and harm the patient. And so the United States Pharmacopeia is recommending that a maximum of 14 days be assigned as the beyond use date. So the date is calculated from the day of compounding. So if I started compounding from today, it means I'm gonna start using today as day one to 14, okay? So we're going to be looking at calculations involved in compounding suspensions in the part two of our lecture. So we're gonna pause here and then we're gonna come back and discuss that.